construction workers are parched from working under the hot sun all day. They have run out of a bottle of water and they decided to knock on the door of the number one house on the block that is finished and occupied. An old lady answers. They tell her their story and she invited them in. They sit at her kitchen table to ensure that the sofa stays clean. She goes to the kitchen to gather up glasses and ice to make them drinks. Water drinks, that is. Meanwhile, the guys notice a bowl of peanuts on the center of the table and begin munching away. She returns and the largest guy blushes and says, sorry ma'am, we got a little carried away and ate all of your peanuts while we were waiting. Oh, that's quite all right, says the old lady. They're too hard for my weary jaw and teeth anyway. I just like to take my dentures out and suck all the chocolate off of them. <laughs> <laughs> you liked that, John, didn't you? <laughs> John chapter 11, 45-53. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Uh, that is the Mary Martha's sister that we're talking about here. When it says, therefore, that starts, it says, therefore, many of the Jews. That therefore refers to the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Because they had seen what Jesus had done, they believed in him. Verse 46, some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priest and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> what, we are what are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better uh, that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. And verse 53, so from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to bring these morsels from your word to the family in this house, Lord. And we pray that you will guide and direct this word to right where you want it to go, and it will have the effect that you want it to have. In Jesus' name, amen. So after Jesus was condemned to be killed by Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, of course, they weren't allowed to kill anybody under Roman rule. The Romans had to do that. But Jesus withdrew to a place in the wilderness, it says, for a time. He knew that his torture and death was coming. On the human side, he may have had to prepare himself for what was coming, and we pick it up in Mark 10, 32. It says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. That's kind of a quizzical picture to me, anyhow. The picture of Jesus leading the way to his own torture and horrible death on the cross. Following Jesus at a little distance were the disciples who were described as amazed, sometimes translated as astonished. But that word from the Greek literally means fear struck. It doesn't sound like that, but literally from the Greek, that's what that means, fear struck. So, I don't know if they knew 
I think there was a fear around this because he was headed for the cross. They didn't know that, but he had told them that. And there was a, there was a, do you ever notice how sometimes there's a fear around? So here we see the divine, but human Christ leading the way to his own death. He was leading the way, following our two crowds of people, first and nearest, uh, they're in fear. It's as amazed, it's as astonished, but it's actually a fear. Maybe for their own lives. This crowd are his disciples, whom he had told that he would be killed. The other crowd, described as afraid, were curiosity followers who knew about Jesus but did not know him personally. Maybe they knew that Caiaphas and the, and the Sanhedrin had condemned him. News traveled fast. They didn't have cell phones, but people talked. There was some dread in both of these crowds, one following closer and the other one farther back. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. Verse 33, we are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man, referring that is to himself, will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Now that was the third time that Jesus informed the apostles that he would be killed and that he would rise again. So this passage of scripture gives us an insight into the character of our Lord. First of all, Christ as hero. We see Jesus going toward the cross, not away from it. No one in all of eternity could do what he is about to do. No one else was ever qualified because no one else lived a perfect life, was the unspotted lamb. So he uh, who relates to the Father as a son in eternity lived a perfect life. He was the only one that ever did that. The ultimate sacrifice had to be perfect. No blemish of sin could be found in him. His perfection accomplished. Jesus now moves toward his own sacrifice. He would take our punishment onto himself. He would purchase our redemption with his own blood. One crowd knew Jesus. They believed in him. They didn't quite understand what was going to happen. But they trusted him. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been following him to Jerusalem. The other crowd knew about him, but they did um, they, they didn't have faith in him as the Messiah. Both crowds were desperate. Desperate for God, just like me. Just like you. Desperate. Sometimes we don't realize our desperation, but we need a hero. We're desperate for a hero. We can't survive an eternity without our hero. Don't leave the planet without Jesus. But we have a hero. He's our Lord. He's our friend. He declared himself to be so. He's the anointed one, the holy one, the victorious one, the one and only one, our hero. All sinners are desperate, desperate for a hero. The hero is ready. He was ready on the road to Jerusalem, and he's ready now. So many desperate sinners reject our Lord as Savior. They refuse to believe him and continue in their own desperation. But the hero is still there. He calls out. Some receive him and are saved. Some reject him, refusing to believe. To their own peril, they do that. Secondly, in addition to seeing him as a hero, we see him as a self-sacrificing hero. He loved us so powerfully 
that he went to, to Jerusalem, knowing that the decree of the Sanhedrin was still in effect, he was walking determined, resolute, to his cross, to his death. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus knew that humanity didn't have any possibility to escape the flames of hell unless he went to the cross, unless he would allow himself to be sacrificed. And he did allow that. He didn't have to. He allowed that because he loved us. He knew what was waiting for him. He knew they would whip him until the until they skin hung in shreds from his back. He knew that. He knew they would, they would pull his beard off of his face. He knew they would press a crown of thorns onto his scalp. He knew they would clamor for his death. Crucify him. And these were his own people. The very ones that he came for. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He knew that there would be torture and torment. He knew he would be rejected and despised. He still despised and rejected today. The Romans were well known for their cruelty, their brutality. He knew that they would have nails driven into his hands and into his feet. He knew that, but he went anyway. I'm convinced that the worst thing he faced, the worst that he sacrificed for a moment on the cross, his father would turn away from him as he became sins. He took on my sin and your sin and the sins of all mankind. His father would turn away from him. He had never been separated from the father and I'm convinced that that was the one thing that he dreaded the most. Matthew 27, 45 to 46, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the ultimate sacrifice, Amen. that he would be forsaken by the Father. Because God, the Father, could not look upon his sin. And he became sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So he took my sins. He took your sins. He took every sin that man ever committed and ever would commit onto himself. How could he do that? He was God. But at that moment, the Father turned away. He had never been separated from the Father before. His sacrifice wasn't only pain and death. So we see him leading the way on the road to his cross, leading toward the ultimate sacrifice. It's important to see that his sacrifice was voluntary. John 10, 17 to 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have, according, uh, I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. He didn't have to save you and me. He did it because he loved us. And that was the only way that we could be saved. That was the only way, and it still is the only way. And thirdly, we see him as the lonely Savior. As Christ led the way on the road that led up to Jerusalem, he was out in front, alone, his disciples were behind him, but he was alone. He was alone in his thoughts, what he was facing. No one could anticipate. No one could anticipate. 
Even his disciples weren't with him in what was about to happen. He had to tell them a third time that he would be killed and rise again on the third day. A third time. Then James and John requested to sit in his right and his left hand in heaven. They weren't concerned about that he was going to die and raise again. They were concerned about their own little um, anticipations. Then the other disciples became indignant about James and John, and an argument rose, and it seems like they didn't even hear what he was saying about uh, uh, being killed and rising again. It seems like they didn't believe in him. Like they, I mean, they believed in him, but like they didn't believe what, was, that what he said was going to happen. He knew that they would scatter, which they did. They fell asleep in the garden. He was alone in his agony. He said, would you watch and pray with me for one hour? And they fell asleep. Even though he had people around him, in a sense, he was alone. We might think that if we had been there, we would have submitted to him, that we would embrace him as Lord, that we would accept him as Savior. But very few believed in him at that point. Just the surrounding, just the, just the disciples that came around him, some people that had been that had been healed and, and people that had seen him raise Lazarus. Only on the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in the upper room, <clears throat> did large amounts of people accept and believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. 3,000 people, <clears throat> Peter preached a sermon, <clears throat> went out and preached it, and 3,000 got saved on that day. <clears throat> and many more were being added daily. That was the beginning of the church. That was the beginning of large amounts of people <clears throat> receiving him and repenting of their sins. Today we're in a great falling away. People <clears throat> refuse to believe to their own peril. Churches are in decline. Evil is on the rise. Homosexuality is evil. It is very explicitly forbidden in the Bible. Abortion is murder. Earth worship is idolatry. <clears throat> the world is on a collision course with God. We need to get busy. We need to be soul winners. If you aren't ready to meet God, get ready, because there isn't a whole lot of time left. I don't honestly know what that means. There's time is short. We've, all, we've been saying that time is short for years. God's time, the way God handles and does and creates time is different from what we think. So we look at the things that are happening, we think, wow, God's gonna be coming back very soon. Yeah, amen. But that's what they thought of World War II. That's what they thought of World War I. That's what they thought when the Romans came and murdered everybody in Jerusalem in 70 AD. They've been thinking that for 2,000 years. It just seems like it's the time. But that's what we think. <laughs> there are people who claim, oh, it's going to happen this year, or this year, or this year. I don't get into that stuff because it, it says you're not going to know. It says we're not going to know. So we have to live every day as though it could be, that could be the day. We have to live as though that could be the day. And that means we have to stay holy. But that also means we have to bring other people in. Amen. 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 Would you stand with me? Jesus says we see that you led the way that you walked ahead on onward toward your cross, toward what would await you to the horrible fate that you chose to have for yourself, for our sake, Lord. We are gratefully, eternally grateful, Lord, because, because we couldn't survive in eternity without you doing that, Lord. So when we see the things around us, Lord, we don't know, we don't understand, but we cling to you, Lord in these murky, difficult times. We, when evil seems to be winning, 
we still cling to you because you are the ultimate victor in the world and in our lives. And we can all, we can depend on that. Well, the disciples, many of them, were martyrs. They went to their death, clinging to their faith in you. And we will do the same, Lord. We will do the same. We'll stick to our faith because it's the only it's the only way. It's the way. It's the only way. It's the one way. It's the true way. It's the holy way. And we just praise and thank you, Lord, that we have the truth, that we know the truth, that someone taught us, that someone preached to us, Lord. And, and Lord, we, we pray for this church, Lord. We pray that you will bring people in here, Lord. We pray that you will bring us into contact outside of church with people that need you, that need a church, Lord. And that we will be able to be soul winners, Lord. Because we know that you want us to do that. We know that you want us to bring more people in before the end comes. So we do thank you. We do thank you. We do trust you. We believe in you, Lord. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.